Tonight, as you're turning to this scripture, I want to preface my remarks uh, again uh, by saying, uh, as nice as I know how, uh, we are not trying to be mean or ugly or self-righteous or critical or fault finder or anything like that at all, not at all. Uh, the stuff that I'm going to show you here in the next few days and weeks is, is, is necessary for a person to know the difference. Uh, you, you show them, you study the real thing 95% of the time and counterfeit 5%. That's why I preach 300 Sundays on the real thing, but then once in a while, the counterfeit. And what you do when you show the counterfeit is you show, like they do this King James Bible thing, they show one version and another version so you can see and compare and know the difference. That's my purpose in doing what I'm doing tonight. I have no personal animosity toward nobody. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, the men that I'm going to be showing you tonight, I don't even know personally, but we're trying to, trying to help you, these kids, to know what is right when our generation is gone. If the Lord don't come, these kids coming up now, are, they're just going to say, oh, well, that's church. They don't know the difference. So they've got to know. And look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 3 and verse 17. Look at chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2, 17. First, uh, 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. We ain't going to do it. We're going to let it say what it says. But as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Now flip over to... Um, Ephesians chapter number 5 and look at Ephesians chapter 5 just for a second and look at verse number 11 Ephesians 5 11 it says and have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness but rather reprove them in other words instead of partaking in, in the crazy stuff reprove it show it put light on it and show it for what it is one more Titus chapter 3 the book of Titus, way over toward the end of the New Testament. Uh, we'll look here in Titus chapter number, th uh, number 3 and verse 10. And it said, A man that is a heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject. So we're not, we're not just talking about different flavors or off dif disagreeing on something that's minor. We're talking about heresy. We're talking about preachers who no longer even believe the Bible. That's what we're talking about. Tonight, I want to preach on what changed the church. The men have changed. Last Sunday, I preached on the method had changed. The way they go about having, they call it doing church. You don't do church. You come to church, you have church, you, we worship God. Now, and the apostles began their ministry when, when Jesus died and rose again and he sent them out to preach. How did they preach? What did they believe? I challenge you tonight to prove this wrong. When the apostles went out and preached in the book of Acts, they believed that the scriptures that they had, Old Testament, were the very words of God. That's what the apostles believed. The, the church fathers believed that also that the word, the scripture that they had were the very words of God. Down through history, we studied it last year on the, on the, the history of the Baptist church. We studied about how that uh, uh, the, the men uh, in the, the uh, dark ages, in the, in the time when the, when, before the Reformation, uh, died because they believed that the Bible was the word of God. And then the Reformation, and then the, the, the old timers come along. And we studied some of the old men in church history. We studied people like uh, uh, John Huss and John Bunyan. John Huss was burned at the stake. John Bunyan was put in jail for preaching. Ladies and gentlemen, they, they put the man in jail just for preaching the word of God. Same thing I preach and same thing we preach today. And they told him, they said, we'll let you out if you'll let up on the, on the preaching against the false religion of our day. And he said, if you let me out today, I'll preach again tomorrow. There's a man who is called 
to preach. And then Paul told Timothy, preach the word. There was David Livingston. David Livingston who served God in Africa as a missionary till the day he died who had a lion come out of the thickets, an African lion, and literally nearly tore his left arm off his body. And his arm was so messed up after that, he had to learn how to shoot his gun this way, left-handed, because he couldn't do like that anymore. We're talking about man who died in Africa. They cut his heart out of his body and buried it in, the, in Africa. These are the men uh, that come right on down from the apostles. Them were men. I mean, brother, that, they, them days was back when men were men and women was glad of it. That's right. And buddy, we studied about uh, the old uh, circuit riding preachers. Preachers who traveled from town to town riding a horse and preached the gospel. And some of them had their lives threatened and some of them had their lives taken for the gospel that they preached. Uh, it's a far different cry. We studied about General William Booth and, and David Brainerd who preached to the uh, northern New England Indians up in, up in New England and the snow that deep and he was so sick he would get off of his horse and he, he was sick and died when he was 29 years old and he was out there coughing up bits of his lungs and they said it looked like little rose petals on that snow with the blood of his lungs coughing up on that snow. And he couldn't even speak their language, but he would preach to them Indians and see tears begin to roll down their face as the Holy Ghost of God convicted them of their sin. And then we come on down to the days of D.L. Moody and uh, right on into the, the, the 1900s with Billy Sunday and then on down with J. Frank Norris and then on down to the men and then uh, Joe Parson, the old man uh, that got saved and preached on him. Then I got, I got saved in a Joe Parson meeting. So I have a, a direct line all the way back uh, to those guys uh, from the over, and I thank God for it. I'm glad of that tonight. I'm glad that I got in on the tail end of the old time preachers that believed the Bible and preached with authority and preached with the fear of God and the fear of God would fall on people and people would get right with God and, and turn up from sin and, and, and live right. I'm glad that I know that. But we're living in a day I, I think when things have changed, people. Back then, they slept in the woods. Uh, they, they, uh, they were shot by natives. They were, had their heads cut off. Nowadays, when a young man comes up and he wants to be a preacher, he looks at it and he sees these evangelists traveling around living like kings and he says, hey, I can do that. And I know, I know preachers. Now, I don't know what it is in, in some of the other uh, that, that, that are not bad, but I know some personally that they think being an evangelist or being a pastor that you are like some kind of celebrity, that you ride a, around in a super nice car and, and you wear the finest of clothes and you play golf uh, two or three days a week and, and there's nothing wrong with any of that if God gives it to you. But that is not the ministry. That is not the ministry. In the, old, in the Old Testament, they were killed. In the New Testament, they were sawn asunder, brother. They, had their, they were burned at the stake. They, they paid with, the, uh, with their lives. They sealed their testimony in their own blood and paid for what they believed with their own lives. I know preachers right now that won't go preach in certain revivals or camp meetings because they say they don't give me enough money. They don't give me enough money there. Now, now listen, people, don't get me wrong. I believe we ought to take care of God's man. I believe, I believe that when we have a preacher come here, we make sure that we take care of their expenses and, and be a, try to be a blessing to them. But I'm, I'm not so sure. I'm, I don't, I'm not so sure that all this uh, preacher's making all this money. Uh, I, I believe it's been a curse on our generation of preachers. And I, I'm not against it. I mean, I know the Bible said a man that does that's worthy of double honor. I'm not against it. I mean, I am one. Uh, but I'm not against taking care of the preacher but it's, it's, it's produced a generation of preachers that feel like they can ride around I mean they, they almost it almost makes you sick to be around them uh, where they got their heads stuck up in the, in the sky and it's uh, come not nigh unto me for I am holier than thou uh, you know and I, I have to stop had them tell me I ain't staying in a motel like that I'll never stay there let me tell you what they used to do they slept out in the woods beside their horse and got up close to it him so they wouldn't freeze to death. We know better than they are. We're, we're not celebrities. 
I know there's a preacher on TV recently raised $54 million for a private jet. I'm not against the preacher even having some if God blesses him and he gets it doing right. But I'm just saying it's change. Matter of fact, matter of fact, there are culture today, listen to me, and I'm going to start the video. Our culture today is in the process of demasculinizing men. We are changing men. Have you noticed how sissy guys are getting every year? More and more. I more. Lord, they're wearing, uh, they're wearing uh, romper suits. Romper suits uh, for a man. Lord, have mercy. Let's all bow our heads and puke. Uh, uh, listen, I'm telling you what, brother. Listen, I mean, these old time preachers, they wouldn't be caught dead uh, putting on makeup uh, or, or running around, uh, brother, uh, running out like this saying, oh, God loves you. And a bunch of bull like that right there. But we're living in a time when men are starting to act, starting to look, starting to talk, and starting to dress more and more like women. And it's spreading into the ministry, sadly. So tonight, uh, with that in mind, I'm going to show you how the men have changed. We ready? All right. Uh, ready, but John? Uh, uh, getting lights back there tonight. Let's start. I'm going to start back just a little bit, a few years back, with a quote uh, from some of the older men. And then you're going to get to see something that very few people have ever seen. And then we'll show you uh, how the men have changed. Amen. Fly them across there, brother. Both hands. There you go. All right, now listen to this tonight. Watch this, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Ethan, give me a uh, tree. You ready? Flip them choir lights all the way to the right, all the way down. They're still on. Uh, all the way to the right. Them two. There's one of them. There's the other. Gotcha. All right, watch this tonight. The men have changed. We're facing a change. A lot of changes from Washington uh, in six and so on down the line. This is a changing world. It sure is. No doubt about that. And I'm not to streamline tabernacle to reach intellectual people. I'm not to streamline tabernacle to reach wealthy people. Amen. In fact, I'm not to streamline, period. My foundation is the same. My doctrine is the same. The truth is unchanged. And God forbid that I... That's what they used to preach like. That was Dr. Harold Seitler. Of the Tabernacle Baptist Church in Greenville, South Carolina. You hear the authority in his voice. It'll make you fear and tremble and fear God. That kind of preaching do. But the men have changed. Is that there is a place of torment. A pl so what does it say? It says hell from beneath. That sort of tells me where it is. I have always believed. And for my study of the Word of God, I believe that hell is in the center of this earth. I, I say, Lord, help me to so preach it that every man that's lost and every woman that's on their way to this awful place of torment will believe what we are saying. See the difference? He said, you know, his emphasis of preaching, the emphasis was on every man and woman who hears this, who's on their way to hell, repent and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the way they used to preach. The emphasis was on eternity and hellfire and heaven. Not because it's J. Harold Smith that's saying it, but because here's what I grew up on when I got saved. Jesus right teaches here. it, and the word. I will wind up eternally separated from Brother the Ed Maccabee, my, one of my heroes. Friend. That kind of preaching got Brother Danny out of the mess he was in. You will now see rare footage. One of the only videos of Billy Sunday in existence. Listen to the preaching. That Billy, Billy Sunday was the most well-known preacher in America in 1910, 1920s and, and the early 20s along in there. There's not much uh, video, but listen, it's not, it's not the best quality, but listen to this preaching. Automobiles. Oh, America didn't need repeal. She needed repentance. Amen. She didn't need wrong righteousness. Amen. We don't need Jags. We need Jesus. We don't need more God. We need more God. Amen. This is D.L. Moody. There weren't, wasn't no video much in his day, just beginning to be invented a little after, around the late 1890s. You'll now hear 
Most of you have never heard the voice of the great preacher D.L. Moody, one of the greatest preachers ever lived. He's just quoting the Beatitudes, but they got it on this recording. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, this is one of the most well known preachers in America now. He's going to tell you that he and some of his friends were all going out to eat one night to the venue. You know, they like to sound cool. And, and, we're going to, and we're going out to eat, and there's a preacher standing on a street corner with a bullhorn preaching about hell and judgment. And look at what this preacher says about the man preaching on the street. This is the preacher. Venue. And up ahead on the sidewalk out front of this guy, he's got one of those bullhorns, and he's yelling all this stuff. And at first I can't hear what he's saying, but as I get closer, I hear the word sin and burn and hell and repent. And then I hear the word Jesus. He said, I hear the word sin and hell and repent, and then I hear the word Jesus. Later, he says, them two don't go together in the same sentence. He says, you can't talk about hell and judgment and, and then talk about Jesus because they're contrary to each other. He's very offended that this guy was preaching about hell. He's got all these pamphlets and he's quoting... Giving out tracts. ...about the anger and wrath of God and how if I don't repent, I'm going to pay for it for eternity and... And how I might die. I might die tonight. This might be my only chance. That's right. It may be. Forever in misery as I burn in hell. I don't think it's what Jesus had in mind. It wasn't? And see, see, bullhorn guy, you're... It's confusing for my friends and I, because some are Christians and some aren't. Therein lies the problem. We hang up, we've got a bunch of friends that are gay, and going out with these people, and I said, and he's embarrassed when a man's sitting there preaching the Bible on the street. It embarrassed him. Listen. We just don't get it. We just don't understand what all the condemning and, and the converting, we don't understand what it has to do with Jesus' message. What? We don't understand? Let, let me give you the words of Jesus. Matthew 5, 22, shall be in danger of hell fire. Jesus Christ said that. Matthew 5, 29, and you're better off to cut your hand off rather than to be cast, your whole body be cast into hell. Jesus Christ said that. Luke chapter 12 and verse 5, I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after you have killed hath power to cast into hell. Rather I say, fear him. Matthew 23, 15, you make him the twofold more child of hell than yourself. Matthew 23, 33, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Luke 16, 23, said in hell the man lift up his eyes. What are you talking about? It is consistent with the message of Jesus. It is. He says, what's that got to do with Jesus? Everything! Here's a man who's a preacher, who's, who grew up in the pastor of a church, who says that it's ridiculous to talk about judgment and condemnation if you're a preacher. Watch this. this and, and to be honest, it's confusing for me. Biblical trajectory. world. Here's what he believes. They believe that all God cares about is right here and now because there ain't no heaven and hell after this life. This world being good and this world being reclaimed and restored. This world being good, this world being reclaimed and restored. That's what the gospel is. It's all about this world being reclaimed and being good. So, the, so if the Bible is a story, it's a story about this place. No, it's it about ain't. this place, the place that... No, it ain't. No, it's not. It ain't just a story about this place. It talks about eternity. God calls good, a place that God loves, a place that is created out of great joy and creativity. And well, in the I think that there's a need. Now listen to this. This is an interview with Doug Paget. Doug Paget is a very well-known pastor in America. And the reason I'm showing you these guys that are so far off is because in 10 years, you're going to see thousands of more preachers and churches believe in the same thing. If you go to a church where there's never a sermon on hell fire. You go to a church where the preacher either don't believe it or he's scared to preach it, afraid some of the people get mad and he'll lose his money. One of the two. I say again, 
If you go to a church where the preacher never preaches a sermon on hellfire, there's something bad, bad wrong. Read the preaching of Jesus Christ in the Bible. What's this? Damnation for people who are not Christians? Yeah, well, I think that there's... Listen to his answer to this question. Do you believe there's damnation for people that are not Christian? Listen to this answer. I think there's all kinds of... I mean, the, the, the damnation would sort of be that, that there's parts of the life and creation that seem to be counter to what God is doing, and those are the things that are eliminated and removed and done away with. What? And so I think that's what damnation is. And so there's people who want to live out that kind of... Um, they want to have that good judgment, the judgment of God in their life. I mean, what? Listen to the interviewer. No, ju judgment in a biblical okay, that, 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 hold on, God right. that God remakes Listen. the world. You, Doug, hold on a second. I have, I have no idea what you just said. Here's what, here's what I think hell is. <laughs> Do you believe there's a hell after you die? And it took him that whole paragraph to say nothing. Now, you know why they give answers? You know why a man can't answer a straight question? Who, who can't answer a straight question just to know people? Politicians. That's who can't answer questions. People that are trying to play both sides of the fence. The people that believe in the old-fashioned way, we want to keep them and their money. And the people that don't believe it, we want to keep them and their money. I hate to say that, but it's the truth. If a man can't give you a straight answer, yes or no, what's wrong with it? Eternal damnation, God sends lawbreakers to a place where there's weeping, there's gnashing of teeth, a lake of sulfur, the worm never dies, eternal conscious torment. Agree or disagree? Disagree. Disagree. He pinned him down and said, do you agree with this or not? Disagree. Now listen to the answer he gives him when he says, if I'm a Buddhist or a Muslim and I die, where do I go? Listen to what he believes about hereafter. What do you think hell is? I think hell is disconnection and disintegration with God. I agree with Where do I go when I die? So are you suggesting to me that heaven is actually a place? When you say, where do I go? You're suggesting to me that the reign of God, that the place of God is, a, is an individual place? That do you hear that? He is amazed that this man thinks heaven is a real place. He said, are you suggesting to me that heaven is a place? See how far off? So you don't think the men have changed? See them old men I played here a while ago? Ask them if they believe heaven's a place. And they'll say, John 14, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Hell is a place. The rich man in hell said, this place of torment that I'm in. They quit believing the Bible, people. They have no authority anymore. No. Is that, is that suggesting to me that heaven is actually a place? We yes, we sure are construct of God wanting to punish people and Jesus needing to save us from God, that isn't Christianity. That's What he said was, this is Doug Paget. he's a well-known pastor of that, oh, I can't think of that place up there, they call him the will tree and creek and water and branch and limb and everything else, and, and the, what he's saying is that Jesus had to rescue us from God, and that's a perverted way to look to God, and it is, that ain't, that ain't at all what happened. That's not at all what happened. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus did not rescue us from God. He, he, he rescued us from hell and paid the price uh, so that God wouldn't have to punish us for our sins. Listen to what he says about hell. How you're supposed to tell that story. But Christianity's big and it's wide and people get to tell it in any way that they want. And I think we need some new language around all of this. right? I think we need to have new ways to talk about... We want new ways to talk about it. Let's get rid of the word hell. These ideas, because the old words, they're not working. Right? It's just simply not working. Sure. No one I know who uses hell and the idea of hell and the concept of hell feels very confident in it. Feels very good about it. Very good. He said, nobody I know who uses the, the, the word hell feels confident about it. That means he don't, he don't know Ralph Sexton. He don't know Larry Brown. He don't know Charles Worley. He don't know Phil Kidd. He don't know C.T. Townsend. All these preachers, there's thousands of them that are confident when they say the word hell. He says he does not know one person who believes in hell that feels confident about it. It's this made-up phrase and word that I think we need to move beyond. I think we not only need to drop the notion, I think we need to drop the word. We drop the notion, 
We drop the word. We don't even say the word hell no more. I say to you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, that is not a preacher. That is not a God-called preacher. God calls his preachers to preach the word. You, don't, you can't take the word hell out. You can't take... I, I'll, I'll just go on a little further and say some other things. And personally, I don't think we can drop the notion until we drop the word. Well, how do we do that? The kingdom of God doesn't come like... Here he says, if the kingdom of God don't come like the kingdom of this world by violence and coercing people. He's trying to compare the Lord coming into the kingdom to like ISIS or United States and everybody having a war. And that's not like it at all. It's, what's it? The kingdom of God comes through suffering and willing victory. He said if it comes through coercion and violence, at the end, God gets his way. In the end, God gets his way. Intimidation and uh, domination, just like every other kingdom does. An alternative to both traditional universalism, in other words, whenever... He said the alternative to traditional universalism and the narrow exclusivist, that's us, understanding of hell, that unless you express, explicitly, uh, explicitly believe, accept, and follow Jesus, you are excluded from eternal life. He said that's got to go. That nation, that notion has to be gone. Saved. And the narrow exclusivist understanding of hell, that unless you explicitly accept and follow Jesus, you are excluded from eternal life with God and destined for hell. You see that? Consider the possibility see how educated that, that sounds? Now here's what he's going to do. He's going to take the whole doctrine of hell and wipe it out of your Bible. And he said, if the destruction of Jerusalem in 67 to 70 AD seems to many people to fulfill much of what we have traditionally understood as hell. That's what they're doing. They're saying, oh, well, when he's talking about going to hell, he was talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and they come in there, there's not no real hell. Well, let's see if there is. Hellfire or end of the universe statements refer not to post-mortem judgment, but to the very historic consequences of rejecting his kingdom message of reconciliation and peacemaking. The destruction of Jerusalem in AD 67 through 70 seems to many people to fulfill much of what we have traditionally understood as hell. I think there's something. So what he's saying basically is, what he's basically saying is that, that uh, there is no hell after this life. When the Bible talks about hell, it was talking about something that's going to happen to them before they die. And here he's going to say it's Gehenna, since there's, you know, there's four words for hell. Gehenna, Hades, Tartarus, and Sheol in the Bible. And he's going to try to make you think that it's just a garbage dump outside of Jerusalem. The word hell is used about 20 times. So I think sometimes just the pure math is helpful for people, just the numbers. What he's saying is that the hell itself is not really there and that hell is only mentioned 30 or 20, 30 times in the Bible. It's actually 53. There's a fire going to burn the trash. So when he even speaks of hell, he's using a real place that everyone, oh yeah, it's the town dump right over there, well, southwest, right over there. No, he's not. No, he's not. Jesus didn't say, if you don't repent and get right with God, they're going to throw you in the city dump. That is not what the Lord said. Um, so I think that's very important. And for a lot of people, that can be very helpful. Cast into hell. Here's what Jesus said. I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. See, you're dead. And after that, after you're dead, have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell yea I say unto you fear him Jesus was saying you better fear God that not just what can happen here but after you're dead hell is a place that people go after they're dead people that's why the rich man died and was buried and in hell lift up his eyes my my but you see, people don't read the Bible no more, so they don't know that. And they just sit there and swallow that like they had good sense. Well, he's a very smart, educated man. He knows Hebrew, Greek words.
Yea, I say unto you, Fear him. Watch it. Judgment, saying that the wicked shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. We can bring hell to earth. For Jesus, heaven and hell were present realities. No, they were not. Ways of living. We no, they were not. He just told a lie. He said, for Jesus, heaven and hell were present realities. If you're chasing good and doing good and living right, you're in heaven. And if you're living wrong, you're messed up and sinning and on drugs, you're in hell. Heaven and hell are here on earth. How many of you ever heard somebody, you try to witness to them and say, you don't want to go to hell? They say, man, I'm already in hell. I always tell them, no, you're not either. You can go back there and get you a drink of water. Yeah, this ain't hell. You can't get no water in hell. Can enter into here and now. I begin with the reality of heaven and hell right now. No. Greed. No, no. Injustice, rape, abuse. We, we see hell on earth all around us all the time. So, no, we don't. No, no, we don't. No, we don't. You ain't never seen heaven. You ain't never seen hell. We see bad stuff. Chance of anything better. This is misguided and toxic. He said that, that, that what, what you and I believe about hell, which is what the Bible teaches, Old and New Testament, Greek and Hebrew, teach there's a place where you go after you die. He said that is misguided and toxic. It's poison. That's what he said. And ultimately subverts the contagious spread of Jesus' message of love, peace, forgiveness, and joy. That We're contagiously ruining the message of Jesus' The difference love. is how we choose to live, which story we choose to live in, which version. Which version of our realities, heaven or hell. Compare that to Brother Lester Roloff. Compare what you just got through listening to to Brother Roloff, who reached thousands of souls, had those girls home out there, Got them, all, got them saved. They got off drugs. Turned into Christian young ladies. Listen to the difference. I've ever had. Reading through the Bible on my knees out loud every year and memorizing one chapter every 30 days. He reads through the Bible every year on his knees out loud and memorizes a chapter of the Bible every 30 days. Do them guys say anything like that? I challenge you to find one of them guys that even even encourages you to read the Bible. They don't want you to read the Bible. I mean, it's the best discipline. People say, well, I I'd like to do that, but, you know, my mind's not as alert as it used to be. The best way to sharpen it up is to put the sword on it. I mean, put the word to it, see? Yeah, I mean, listen, the Holy Spirit will quicken your mortal mind if you put enough of the word of God in it. The thing is... We, most of us, and I don't mean to be critical, the Lord knows that, but most of us do not stay in the Bible enough to think Bible thoughts. Right. I mean, you've got to live in the Bible. I mean, if you live in the newspaper, you'll talk newspaper. If you read magazines... you telling me the men ain't changed, people? That's what you used to hear preaching. Listen to this. You'll uh, be talking magazines, and if you watch television, you'll be television mad. Brother, whatever you give your mind to, you're going to have that kind of a mind, and you know it. Yeah, man. Right. And why no? Well, well, we go from that to this. We're going out on the fringe a little bit here now. Thought you might. This is where it's going. This is Brandon Barthol up in uh, Minnesota who has that um, drunken glory ministry. Began over up in Toronto, Canada. How many of y'all heard of the Toronto Blessing? Uh, a movement that started up in Canada. And then the Florida outpouring, where people uh, were just acting drunk. Because the Bible said they thought the disciples were drunk, you know, in Acts chapter 2, because they were so filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, that's, this is not exactly what the apostles were doing. This guy has a converted crack house. He makes his own drugs and calls it the glory of God because it's incense and snorts incense to get high and worship God. Listen to this. Apostolic. Watch it. The hipster preacher with a congregation of thousands. You better feel it. And jacking up with imaginary needles. And why were so many people watching him do it? 
part of a fresh generation of godly drunks which have been growing since an event in 1994 known as the Toronto Blessing, when a whole load of pious Canadians suddenly appeared to be smashed while soberly attending church. The Florida outpouring, a similar event in 2008, signalled a new form of worship as churches began to embrace modern media. For the, first time ever, for the first time ever, the internet became the number one place to get your Christianity in America. Oh boy. People personally have said to me, I've just laid my hands on me. Welcome to the crack house. Welcome to the crack house. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Why is it so fragrant in here? Oh, I'm burning frankincense. I do a lot of stuff with uh, essential oils just for like fun and we snuff, we like snort them and huff them and get all jacked up on them. Now he uses Cynthia, he makes his own. This is his ministry. Hey, if them other guys can take hell out of the Bible, I reckon he can snort incense. Who's to say he can't? And he, this girl here is interviewing him and he's showing her some of his drugs. And just, just listen to this. This is a ministry. Thousands of people. You can look it up at uh, Joel's Bar on, on the internet. They have services on that. Does that make you high? <laughs> yeah, do you want to try it? This stuff's so pure that you can be orally ingested and, and huffed up the nose. And you just pour a little on there. Okay. And just bring it right into your brains and get high on frankincense. Now, he's going to tell you, since they brought frankincense to Jesus when he was born, that therefore Jesus got high as a baby and stayed high his whole life. So that, that's allowed, right? I guess it's oh, godly. Oh, it's totally legal. Okay, yeah, I mean, cool. Jesus, and when I was a baby, he started huffing frankincense right, right in the crib. It's evidence he was high from birth. Jesus started huffing frankincense in the crib, and he was high from birth. Yeah. The Lord was saying, the, the devil had his crack house, now I'm going to have my crack house, and they're going to get high in my crack. That's one of his church members. Heard the congregation. Our uh, goal is to trance out the entire planet. Look at that, they're bumper stickers. Godka. Drunk on Jesus. Jehoviana, <laughs> that's a new one. High on Jesus. The drunken glory and, and holy hammered. Let them physically experience that there's no high like the Most High, and there doesn't have you don't have to like spend all your money to get high. It's a free substance yeah. that's closer than the air you breathe. There's no high like the Most High. There's the congregation. Is experiencing God and. I would say drunkenness is a form of intimacy with God. Their drunkenness is a form of intimacy with God. You better shut that stuff up, buddy. You better watch what you're saying. Pure love, pure joy. You don't drink crack. <laughs> is the most evil substance on the face of the earth. Christianity in its purest. Christianity is purest form. Listen to this. This is what he says about Christianity. Forum is pure pleasure, pure spirituality that benefits everyone around you continuously by positive energy. Uh, 2,000 years ago, they were experiencing ecstasy in the Holy Spirit, and it's been just a common occurrence throughout the entire church history. And so the drunkenness is simply ecstasy. He said that real Christianity is experiencing ecstasy, and that ain't right. That ain't true. That's flesh, that ain't spirit. The men have changed. What would Billy Sunday think about that? What would D.L. Moody think about this preacher? I mean, I don't know the guy. I feel sorry for him. I hope he, we're going to cheer his testimony. He's got a very, very, very strange testimony. It's pure biblical Christianity. That's pure biblical Christianity. It is, buddy. I've been messed up somewhere. <laughs> That night, it, it was also Christmas. It's frankincense. You guys, for so long we've had so much uh, persecution and very little support from anybody in the church, and that's how it's been for like six years. That is shifting the drunken glory going mainstream. My God, I mean, why? You know, if you have some really good drugs, you know you don't keep those to yourself. 
you got to find people to do them with. And I'm telling you, we found the perfect drug. It's, it was began coming out of them. Here's, say, here's what he said. When he got saved, demons started coming out of him. This is testimony. I'm not the judge. I'll let you listen. This is testimony. Out of my body, I would see visions of where they'd been. I saw visions of Mesopotamia, saw ancient wars. It feels like literally 10,000 watts of electricity going over my whole body. So he said he was somewhere doing something, and 10,000 volts of electricity goes through his body, and he sees ancient Mesopotamia and ancient wars. I'm literally more high at that point than I'd ever been, and I hear a voice speak over my head. He said, I will make you more high than all the drug addicts, and I'll make them jealous of how high I get you. That, that's what God said? God said, I'm going to get you higher so all the drug addicts will be jealous of you? And I'm just in utter disbelief and shock. Like everything in my life had just been washed clean. And I mean, I didn't say any fancy prayer. I didn't like, you know, read the Bible or anything like that. It was just... I, nothing to do with the Bible. Nothing to do with prayer. What? That's basically struck by lightning by a God I didn't even believe in. <laughs> weird, man. Weird, weird, weird. Look at this little service going on here. This is the Holy Ghost. Praying for each other isn't quite like the old pious woman at her bedside. No, it sure ain't. Kind of thing. I mean, we're talking, it right. gets crazy. You've seen the old, like, Charlotte, North Carolina, and the people... He's, this was in, that one in Charlotte, but he said this meeting was in Charlotte, and people got slain with the Holy Ghost crawling out, and they had to, cops had to come bring their, their drug dogs because they thought they was all, all on something and had to sniff them out. Crawling out of the meetings, I mean, just such a heavy intoxication. And, and, uh, and, the, the, and so the police showed up with a squadron of uh, canine drug dogs, uh. and they had the drug dogs sniffing up our congregants, trying to figure out what they were snorting, right? But at the end of the day, we just had to explain, it's just the presence of God. <laughs> you reckon? Now, now, now listen now, people. You reckon? I mean... That's the presence of God? Watch this. Watch this. Me neither. Look, at this is the presence of God. I'm going to show you something here. The presence of God, brother... And here it comes. It is fury and it is bloodlust. Now listen, he's talking about God here. I want you to get to this, this sermon. Listen to this sermon. He said, God, the Father, is coming in his bloodlust. And he's mad. He's going to kill Adam and Eve for eating an apple. And he comes in, he's getting ready to kill them. And about that time, stop! Jesus steps in. This is how he tells the story, which that ain't even right. But listen to you. People don't know no difference. Listen to this. You know, his wrath has to be appeased. His bloodlust has to be appeased. Someone ate his apple, and so with veins beating out of the side of his head. Somebody ate an apple, and veins were beating out of the side of his head. And then about that time, Jesus steps in and says, Whoop, good cop, bad cop. Don't even know the story. Face beat red, he's about to release his wrath on you. And then, oh, Jesus steps in, good cop, bad cop. It's not about looking. This is Rick Warren. He's the man that has almost brought on the seeker-sensitive change of churches in America. I told you last week how that then, and, and there's a lot here that we, we'll get to. Joel Osteen and some of them guys, not next Sunday night, but the following, two weeks from the night. And, and we're going to let you see how these people got their ideas that you set up a stage that looks like a nightclub and you put lights shining around that looks like a nightclub, and you have music that sounds like a nightclub, and then everybody starts this kind of stuff, and they start going, oh, he's got, he's Jesus, he's Jesus, he's, it's just great, and it's wonderful, and, I, and it gets real dark and weird. You'll see that next Sunday night. And now it turns, they call that church, and here's the philosophy. Good, feeling good, or having the goods, it's about being good and doing good. 
It's about being good and doing good. God gets pleasure watching you be you. Why? He made you. That's my girl. You're using the talent and the ability that I gave you. So my advice to you is look at what's in your hand, your identity, your influence, your income, and say, it's not about me. It's about making the world a better place. Thank you. That was his speech. He had an opportunity to tell millions of people how to get saved. And he said, look at what's in your hand. Now, I mean, I know there's nothing wrong with taking what you've got and giving it to God and finding out your talent. I believe in all that. But if you've got a chance to witness to millions of people, you don't say it's not about you. It's about making the world a better place. Listen, people. Making this world a better place is false doctrine. We're called to call, you're called to come out of the world. Have no fellowship with the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You listen? Listen to this prayer. That you are connected to Christ. Hear that? There's a catch. You hear a preacher say that word all the time? Connect. That's a giveaway right there. Connect. There's a bunch more of them I'm going to give you in a couple of weeks. Words that you can listen for. Give them away in a second. Here's the way you know you're connected to Christ. Here's the way you get saved. So let's bow our heads together. I'm going to pray a prayer, and you can follow it silently in your mind. Let's pray. Wrong things. Today I want to take the first step in preparing for eternity by getting to know you. Jesus Christ, I don't understand it all, but as, as much as I know how, I want to open up my life to you. I ask you to come into my life and make yourself real to me. And use this series in my life to help me know what you made me for. Thank you. Amen. Now, if you just prayed that prayer for the very first time, I want to congratulate you. You've just become a part of the family of God. Reckon? Now, now let, wait a minute here now. No mention of sin. No mention of the cross. No mention of Jesus paying the price for our sin. No mention of the wages of sin is death. No mention of accepting him as, our, as a payment for our sin. Nothing. No gospel in that at all. Lord, help me to learn my purpose. Another gospel. As only a symptom of a greater sickness, the fruit of the church growth movement. The fruit of the church growth movement in America is this. Which he is a part. This prevalent movement, prevalent movement within evangelical Christianity can be identified by a philosophy of ministry intentionally designed to effect numerical growth. The seeker-sensitive label is often associated with these megachurches in the United States where Christian messages are often accompanied by elaborate spectacles and elements drawn from secular pop culture, such as rock music. What he's saying is, the church movement today is using worldly methods to get a crowd of people and sprinkling a little Jesus in there at the end and make everybody think it's wonderful what he's saying and that's what's happening the men have changed and other forms of entertainment their methodologies are often more attentive Listen. and demographics rather than biblical instruction the church growth movement and biblical instruction the church growth movement was founded by two people independently Donald McGavran and Robert Schuler. Donald McGavran and Robert Schuler. that's where these guys got their inspiration uh, and Peter Drucker who was a market strategist who taught people how to build a big business. And that's how the, the strategy, said, let's, let's build a business. Both men influenced Rick Warren. Rick, I want to end tonight by saying this. I'm glad I went to church one night and heard an old time preacher. I'm glad for preachers that even though I might not have liked it, stood and told me that I was a sinner. I'm glad that somebody told me, Danny, you must get right with God. I'm glad that through the hard times in my life, that book right there, every word of it, sustained me and the problems that I've been through. I'm glad that we got the Word of God in our hands, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad tonight that old time preachers preach the same thing the apostles preach and the same thing the Old Testament preachers preach and right on down through the church fathers and right on up 
until this generation that me or you in right here. And you know what the Bible says about this generation? Many shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Give me just a light over the choir here, Brother John, the two far ones. I say unto you, like I said last week, if you go to a church, wherever you hear this message, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, if you go to a church and you never hear us preaching on these seven things, you go to a church where the preacher either does not believe the Bible or is scared he's going to lose his paycheck. Number one, the blood of Jesus Christ is the only way sins can be forgiven, washed away, or taken off of your record. Number two, the second coming of Jesus Christ with a thousand year millennial reign of Jesus on this earth in the future, not now. Number three, worldliness, being separate from this world who don't know Jesus Christ. Number four, modest dress. A Christian should dress in certain ways that will honor God and not wicked or sexual. Number five, rock music. Any preacher that's called by God that's worth a dime will preach against rock music. Sexual sin, shacking up, homosexuality, any kind of sexual deviancy, uh, pornography, dirty movies, all of that. A sermon on that. And number seven, hellfire. Those seven things. You either have a preacher that don't believe it or he's scared of his member and decides to keep it for a paycheck coming in. I want you to know this, this evening, folks. People like me are a dying breed. There's some young preachers coming up, and I thank God for it, and I believe that God's going to always have preachers that stand. Thank God for these young men. Uh, C.T. and Cody and all these young men coming up everywhere preaching the truth. Thank God for them, and I believe they're going to continue the mainstream, big time, big shot stuff is going further and further and further away from this book. The men have changed. If you're a man here this evening, be a man. Be a man. Love your family, love your wife, take care of them, pay the bills, live right, serve God, and stand up and be a man. Take your family to a Bible preaching church and learn it, love it, and live it. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed this evening. We want to thank the Lord that it is well. It is well with our soul. As she plays softly tonight, maybe there needs to be somebody here tonight get something settled with God. I don't know. But if there is, I just slip out of my seat. Come on down here. Let's get, get it right with the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name that you'd bless every single person here tonight. Maybe, maybe there might be somebody here tonight who's never been saved. I pray this will be the night that you'd touch their heart and they'd learn the truth and know the truth and love the truth and live the truth. God, help us in these dark days and last hours to stand for you, to do what's right, serve you and do the will of God. Whatever and however you do for us, we'll praise you and thank you for it. Bless everybody this week. Give us a good week, Lord. Meet back with us this weekend. Touch our men as they pray. God, get us ready for the youth rally. Holy Ghost, come down, do a mighty work. And we'll thank you and praise you for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen.